Hey, you took theologians. God loves life. That's the kind of the thing that's going on in Genesis chapter 1 when the Lord says it's good. It's good because it has to do with life, it has to do with human life. Which means that we got a lot of work to do in the midst of a culture of death. We just passed a couple of days ago the 49th anniversary of the Roe uh, decision in the United States here, legalizing federally abortion. And we had a handful of events at church, and one of those on Friday night was a dinner, and we were reflecting on the three ways that. Um, Lutheran theology can add to the pro-life conversation. And this is not to bust any other theological chops. It's just, you know, every confession has some unique things to it. And there's three things that we Lutherans have, at least three things, maybe more, that, um, that help us. And those things are the three estates, a theology of suffering, and law and gospel. And I want to talk about those. But how do we get here? We want to remember that when we fell, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, it, we became slaves. Hum, humans are slaves to our own passions. And we recognized then that the law, natural law, God's law, human law, is in a profound way to protect us from our own passions. I mean, it's a frightful thing to sit and meditate on on all the crimes that each one of us would commit if we could get away with it. Um, you think of even a baby that has no restraints, how, how that child would be a thief and a murderer if they had the strength uh, and the kind of know-how to do it. So, so all of us are fighting against our own passions and the law comes along to help us to do that and say, you can't steal, you can't murder, you can't lie, you can't commit adultery, etc. But one of the things that we are facing in our own culture is that the Sixth Commandment passions, you shall not commit adultery, that the, whatever number you want, that those, that those passions are saying we should not be constrained by law. And anything that sh would stand in the way of our passions it has to be thrown out. And so you get, I mean, I think that's pretty simple. That's how you end up with abortion and everything else. You know, you, if I've got to be able to do whatever I want to do with no consequence. Okay. So we should fight for... Um, we should maybe realize with humility that all of us need the constraints of the law and that it's good for us and it's good for our neighbor and it's good for this entire thing called human society and we should strive for just laws that, that constrain destroying passions. So that's the fight, that's the legal fight. You know, we want we want abortion to be illegal. We also want it to be unthinkable, and that's the cultural fight. But these two things are connected to each other. The law is also a preaching because it tells us what is acceptable and what's not. And the punishment it comes not only in legal forms, but also in, in cultural forms and in the form of shame and things like that. So, so that's the background. Now, how do we add something into that? conversation, the first thing I think that the kind of unique Lutheran thing that we can bring into the conversation is our understanding of the three estates. Now every theological denominational confession has some understanding of what I'm about to talk about. In The Calvinists oftentimes call it sphere sovereignty. The Catholic tradition calls it subsidiarity, and that's been picked up by a lot of evangelicals. So, uh, but but here's the the Lutheran. I, I, one of the advantages of our Lutheran understanding is that when it says the three estates, it makes a list. There's one, two, three, not four, not two. There's three estates, and they are the family and the church and the state. We've talked about it a lot before. If you just go, if you Google three estates, Wolfmuller. You know, I've got a whole collection of stuff on the website about the three estates. And, but, but we'll remember that 
we understand that the Lord has created uh, three realms in which we live. And part of the genius of it, if you go back to the Middle Ages and you look at the three estates, you were in one or the other or the other. You were either part of those who pray, a monk or a priest, the religious estate, or those who fight, the kings and the soldiers and the lawyers, the political estate, the state state, state estate, or those who work, that you were on the land, you were a farmer or a serf, you were part of the family estate, the home that was there. One or the other or the other. In fact, when you went into the religious estate, you had to vow to not be part of the other estates. You had to take a vow of poverty and chastity and obedience, not to your parents, but to the, to the one who is ruling in the order. So the estates uh, were siloed. That just doesn't hold up according to the scripture. And that whole system crumbled. And the genius of Luther and the Wittenberg theologians was to see that each one of us lives and has callings and stations in each one of the estates. So each one of us is part of the church, part of the state, and part of the family. And that those three estates will stand until the end of time. It's one of the dangers of our modern political order is that it says, well, you might not be in a family and you might not be in a church, but you are in a state. And so the state has to absorb every function. The state now does not feel secure leaving anything out of its own domain because it just doesn't even acknowledge the permanence of the family and the church. So that's a big problem. We recognize that the family exists for the bringing forth and supporting of physical life and spiritual wisdom, that the church exists to bring forth eternal life, and that the state exists to bring forth little bits of death to avoid the huge parts of death. That's the power of the sword. So that the state is an, a, a, a servant estate to serve the family and to serve the church where life can flourish. And so when we look at our understanding of the three estates, we know exactly how, well, not exactly, but it gives us a, a map for looking of how can we be involved in this conversation? What is the important parts of the conversation? How can, what, what's the government's role in this particular thing? And what's the role of the family? What's the role of the church? So forth and so on. By the way, when we look at the relationships between the three estates, that's where things get really interesting. But what is the relationship of the state to the church and what is the relationship of the church to the state. We could talk more about that uh, in other places, but that's it's good to meditate on those things and we have a framework for doing so. So the three estates. Number two is our theology of suffering. There are those in the church who think that suffering is a mark of God's abandonment. Especially you have your kind of health and wealth, the um, word of faith movement, which assumes that every Christian should be um, healthy and wealthy. Uh, you, you got the extreme forms of that as it's kind of the positive thinking with a Christian veneer on top of it, but it's pagan thought. That's Joel Osteen. But you have a sort of, you have a soft version of that, what some people will casually call a theology of glory, and that is the idea that if God loves me, then things will go well for me. This is simply not true biblically, and the old Lutheran theologians brought this out with, again, what's casually called the theology of the cross, but it should better just be the cross, acknowledging what Jesus says. Uh, if anyone would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow me. So to say it plainly, that the Christian life is a life of suffering. Luther suggests at one point that there should play a game, and it would be that it's basically how to identify the scriptures. And so he says, you look at a verse and you say, is it teaching or instruction? And if it's teaching, is it teaching my sin, law, or is it teaching God's kindness, gospel? Is it instruction? Is it, in, is it teaching me how to love? Or is it teaching me how to suffer? And those are the four categories that you need to understand the Bible. Doctrine of sin, doctrine of grace, instruction in love, instruction in suffering. That, that, that suffering is what it means to be a Christian. 
In fact, at the end of his On the Councils and the Churches, which is a beautiful work, you can download that for free at the website. It's one of the uh, Everyone's Luthers that we've published. And if you go to wolfmuller.co slash downloads, you can find all the books to download there. On the Councils of the Churches, Luther ends that with this list of the seven marks of the church. And his last mark, the seventh mark of the church, is that the church possesses the glorious, precious cross so that you can know where the Christians are by looking for who's suffering oh that we could embrace this theology it's so hard we because we're natively against it we we natively think that it, like Job's friends that if we're suffering it must mean that God has abandoned us but where do we find God and the very heart of God is in the suffering of Jesus on the cross so that God comes to us in suffering in this agony and his bloody sweat in the garden and his and his forsakenness and all he Jesus comes to us to bless us in the cross and we follow him in that way uh, I was what where was this this must have been another Luther sermon he says how can you expect the body to be clothed in silk when the head is crowned with thorns Now this isn't to say that every, that other churches don't have a theology of suffering, but it it's one of the it's a unique it's one of the Lutheran uniquenesses that we understand that, that that our Christian life is a life of suffering, that sanctification is suffering, and so forth, and that the Lord calls us to joy in the midst of suffering, to rejoice in it. Romans five, James one, First Peter four. Jesus, in the, remember how Jesus says it in the Sermon on the Mount: "Blessed are you, blessed are you when you are." persecuted for my name's sake. Blessed. Rejoice. Jesus says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. We say, well, I'm rejoicing. But then Jesus says, but are you exceedingly glad? Whew. They left the Sanhedrin, Acts chapter what, four? They left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name. So, when we see the culture saying that suffering is the worst evil, and that when we can't end the suffering, then it's best just to end the sufferer, euthanasia. Or when we see a child unwanted and seemingly born into very difficult circumstances, we say it's better for that child not even to, to live than to live a life of suffering. Then we recognize that our culture needs uh, to understand uh, uh, the biblical doctrine of suffering. And that suffering does not mean that God has forsaken us. Okay, third, law and gospel. And this is important. The second generation of Lutherans gathered at the, to, to put together the formula of Concord said that the distinction between law and gospel is a most brilliant light that illuminates the scriptures. Uh, the law is what God commands of us. The gospel is what God does for us in the death of Jesus and the, and the promise of what God does for us being brought straight to our own ears, our own hearts, our own minds, our own consciences to cleanse our conscience and give us the confidence of God's love for us. So we look at the scripture and we see that God speaks to us in both law and gospel. So we want to speak clearly the law to ourselves, to our neighbors, we want the law to be spoken clearly in our own culture, you shall not murder. But we also want to speak the gospel to murderers and say that Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus shed his blood for you. Jesus is not angry with you. Jesus has reconciled you to himself and to the Father. That he will not leave you or forsake you. That the blood on our hands is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And though our sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. The statistics in regards to abortion are that 23.7% of women in the United States who have been involved in an abortion by age 45. 
And that says nothing of the men, the dads involved, and of the other people involved. Friends and family. Carrie saw some incredible statistic about how many uh, abortions are committed willingly versus how many women feel pressured into it. Uh, it's outrageous. So, so there's a lot of blood on a lot of hands. And the only hope is in Christ. But there is hope. Can you imagine that there would be people who would say, "Well, Pastor, I don't, um, I don't want to go to heaven because I'm afraid that I might have to face there the children that I that I killed." But the reconciliation that Jesus has accomplished on the cross is so thorough and so complete that when King David dies and goes into glory, he is not only greeted by the smile of Jesus, but also by the smile of Uriah the Hittite. That Uriah is glad to welcome him into his kingdom. That's the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus has given. And that is a hope so profound and a promise so secure and a gift, so, such a treasure, a valuable gift that it, it's nowhere else but in the church. Now, the entire Church of Jesus has the gospel. I'm not saying that the Lutherans have a, a corner on the gospel, but that understanding of law and gospel, that, that, that these two words must be spoken, it, it holds it to this. So that when we come to these, abor to these life issues like abortion and, and suicide and, and uh, euthanasia and uh, the culture of death and, and how our own culture uh, acts here at the the kind of in the fury of the sexual revolution that's happening in our own culture, when it, when it comes to what we do, that we not only speak the law, but also, and most especially, that we speak the gospel, which is this. It doesn't matter what you have done, what crimes you've committed, what commandments you've broken, how far you have fallen short of the glory of God. This is why Jesus died for you. Christ Jesus came for sinners, says St. Paul, of whom I am the foremost, so that, so that Jesus is a, a, a better Savior than you are a sinner. That's what, the, the, that's what the business of the cross is. Cleansing, cleansing us from all our iniquities. So you are clean, you are covered with his righteousness, you are washed. You are His. And that light and that hope and that peace, ah, that's what Jesus wants us to have. So may God grant us some sanity in our own age and also some comfort and peace. I think these three, three things are hopefully helpful. And, um, and I hope that we can add them to the pro-life conversation, the understanding of the three estates, the understanding of the theology of suffering, and the right distinction between law and gospel. Oh, my God, grant it for Christ's sake. God's peace be.